All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Jenna Lewinson. I work for the Fish and Wildlife Service, and Rita, Risa, and I are going to be just giving a high-level overview of what our office is working on. Uh, I have 18, or we have 18 slides, so we'll just try to motor through and leave time for questions. Okay, so I'll start with our five-year reviews. Um, these are like status reviews to see, you know, do these plants still meet the definition of threatened or endangered? We're supposed to do them every five years. Uh, we recently completed three of them. Let me see if you can see my cursor. <clears throat> and we have a lot on deck for this fiscal year. Um, we'll be put, publishing them on ECOS, which is a website. Um, I don't have the link posted, but we do have it in the abstract that you all should have as one of those handouts. Okay, and in terms of recovery plans, um, we have quite a number of our listed plants that don't have recovery plans, even though they've been listed for a while. Um, we have a draft recovery plan for Jones Cyclodynia that is available for public review um, right now until March 13th. And there are actually two separate documents to review. We have a draft recovery plan, which is a standalone document, and then a draft biological report, which um, they're both available, uh, two separate links on our ECOS website. I know it's a little confusing on how to get to both. They're part of, um, you know, for this recovery plan, it would be like a three-part format um, the recovery implementation strategy is something I'll work on after um, the public comment period and, and any updates that I need to make for the, the original two documents. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about Joan Cyclodynia over the next couple of slides. Um, and the draft recovery plan for the two Uinta Basin cacti, um, that's you know, Rita's the lead on that. That's going to be coming out soon. We don't have a federal federal register date for, for that yet. And then when those two are done, we're going to move forward on our draft recovery planning for the two pedio cacti. And for Kodachrome bladder pod, you know, we have two new populations um, for, for that species, but um, we really are trying to line up funding to get a genetic analysis to confirm their identity before we um, finish our draft recovery plan uh, for that species. Okay, so a little bit more about Jones like Lydinia. This is timely because um, you all can comment on the draft recovery plan. Just to give you a little bit of background, um, it's one of three varieties of Cyclodinia humilis. Um, the other two varieties occur in California, that's variety humilis and variety venusta. Um, and it originated a long time ago. You know, we think it's a tertiary relic. So somewhere between 66 and 2.6 million years ago. Um, it is a long lived clonal plant. So we have individuals which are genets that are made up of, you know, one or more stems or ramets here. Um, and we have uh, some genetic work from Paul Wolf, Sidonia Sipes, and Vince Tepidino to estimate there are approximately 22 stems or ramets for each genet out there. Um, so that was a part of our calculations for total population size. Um, it does reproduce by seeds, but seed production appears to be low, and we actually need more information on this range wide. Um, John Spence, who just recently retired, collected um, pretty much the only data we have on seed production. Um, so we included you know, seed production as a recovery criteria um, in order to highlight that importance and collect more information on it. And then pollinators, you know, we haven't had a lot of work um, on pollinators. They're unknown, but possibly butterflies and bees. Um, and 
uh, Lee Johnson has shared with us some photos. Um, you know, these, the flowers kill or trap their uh, flower visitors with their sticky sap that they exude. And um, these are, you know, they just basically die on the flower. Um, so we're hoping to roll out some kind of um, monitoring either through RANA or some other, you know, kind of camera monitoring um, in the future at a couple of our recovery units. Okay. So next slide, um, here's a rundown of the status, you know, at the time of listing versus what we know now. Um, the status has improved considerably since listing. Um, we have 20 populations in Utah and Arizona, and basically a tenfold increase in the total population compared to what we knew at the time of listing. Um, so they're organized into 20 populations, um, comprised of 60 sites. Um, and while we have more populations, you know, most of them as, are small, as you can see in the breakdown here. Um, and, you know, even though we have this large increase, um, the taxon still only occurs on about 2,000 acres of occupied habitat. So that's a really small acreage, um, uh, range-wide acreage for uh, a rare plant. Um, in terms of threats, you know, recreation is no longer a threat. Uh, the BLM resource management plans that were finalized in 2008 restricted use to designated routes, uh, and Glen Canyon did the same. Uh, what hasn't changed is that um, a lot of the population areas are still open to energy development. Um, it's not a current or imminent threat, but we consider that a future threat. Um, and so, you know, habitat protections um, and restrictions for energy development is something we would like to see in the future. Vulnerabilities uh, remain the same. That hasn't changed uh, in terms of low reproduction, small population size, and the fragile soils that this taxon grows on. Okay, so here's something new. You know, this is how we delineated our four recovery units based on geographic location. Our four units contain most of the populations, the one population that's not included in a recovery unit, um, and we're not relying on recovery, is uh, located on tribal lands. So we plan to work with the Ute tribe to discuss monitoring and any protections that they would like to afford to this population, but we, um, at this point in our draft, are not including it in a recovery unit or relying on it for recovery. Here are four draft criteria. Most of them need to have measurable thresholds to identify how to achieve recovery. You know, the first two are demographic-based criteria, you know, identifying we want a stable or increasing trend over a 10-year period, as well as a total population size threshold that can be calculated over a five-year period. Um, the third criterion talks about the need for habitat protections, and then, you know, we want to preserve the genetic diversity that exists in an offsite location. That's a pretty common criteria for many of our other recovery plans. Okay, so that's all I have for Jones. Um, the next slide is just to highlight that we do have a uh, a new listed plant in Utah. It's, you can see it on my background too, the Fixed Plains Cactus. Um, you know, it is listed as endangered, uh, previously only known in Arizona. Um, and there are three plants that we know of on BLM lands in Utah in the Hurricane Cliffs area, uh, found or confirmed last year by Kip Lee. Um, I believe that more extensive surveys are planned this year. So if you are planning to survey, I know that UNPS has like a cactus working group. If you could let me know, I'd appreciate it. I know the BLM is planning to do some surveys this year <clears throat> and other contractors working on projects in Washington County also um, maybe asking for a reference population. So I'd appreciate, you know, just a coordinated effort and reporting for this species. Um, cause I, you know, I want to make sure I'm giving the, the latest and greatest information to folks. 
Um, surveys were performed for the cactus in the Lake Powell pipeline right away over 10 years ago, um, and none were found at that time. But, you know, uh, if and when this uh, project moves forward, there will be surveys for the cactus um, within that right of way alignment prior to construction. Okay, and then I'll just touch upon some of the projects I know many of you are familiar with, but um, you know, the lens I'm going to share is how plants may be impacted or benefit um, from these projects. So for Northern Corridor, you know, a very high controversial uh, project, you know, the focus has been on the Mojave Desert Tortoise. Um, this is the highway through Red Cliffs National Conservation Area. It's just over four miles long, um, but we don't have any listed plants in our highway right of way. Um, and so one of the measures to offset, uh, offset the effects of desert tortoise is the creation. So here's the highway, proposed highway. And then um, the offset um, to benefit desert tortoise is this proposed zone six. Um, and it's a combination of BLM lands here in yellow and then state lands in blue. It's almost a 50-50 split on just over 6,000 acres. Uh, the dwarf bear poppy will definitely benefit from the creation of zone six. There's quite a bit of habitat on state lands that um, are not currently afforded protections and it's part of our red bluffs um, poppy population. Oh, I guess I should mention homegrown milk batch is also located uh, in zone six, but it's on BLM land. So I'm not quite clear on if there's any additional benefit uh, to the species, um, really, you know, the critical habitat units are fenced and, you know, use is restricted there. So I'm not sure that there's um, a real benefit for home grins in, in zone six. Okay, so the next project is the Washington County Habitat Conservation Plan. This is a plan for the desert tortoise with a 25 year term. Um, it was finalized in January. And the discussions uh, were at least five years in the making. So the Habitat Conservation Plan doesn't cover plants, but we were able to work um, out additional habitat protections with SITLA for homegrown milk vetch in the Central uh, Valley Critical Habitat Unit. Um, something else that was a part of a commitment was uh, UDNR and, and Mindy's crews to survey prior to development. This is something that has been happening to a lim limited extent, but we're now kind of formalizing it, elevating it as a priority um, to do surveys in coordination with uh, desert tortoise clearance surveys um, prior to construction. And then, you know, this was this commitment here was uh, contingent on if the northern corridor is approved. Um, to develop a survey seed collection and plant salvage plan uh, with the county and other partners. We've already started that, but you know, this effort really needs to be kind of ramped up and, and provide better coordination. And I think you know, having the county involved is really gonna be a big boost to those areas that we simply cannot um, protect um, you know, from development. And then I already mentioned the benefits to the poppy from zone six. And then Lake Powell Pipeline, another big project. Right now, the um, state of Utah is producing a supplemental EIS. Um, they've addressed to address public comments from their draft EIS. This supplemental EIS is going to include a, a local waters alternative in the event that Lake Powell Pipeline is not approved. It's certainly not their preferred alternative, um, but they are responding to public comments. So, you know, this is a complicated project. There are a number of issues that could complicate this, like the Colorado River Compact. But in terms of plant impacts um, for their preferred alternative, avoidance is possible for all of our listed plant species, even including the fixed plains cactus. And then the listing update. Um, 
you know, we are preparing to publish the, our decision for the penstemons. Uh, we've completed our analysis of the species status and it's undergone peer and partner review. So we anticipate it's gonna be very soon, definitely before the end of the fiscal year that um, our decision is published. And then for the milk fetches, you know, that's something that um, Rita's the lead for and she's actively working on a species status assessment for those two. And so I think I should let Rita jump in and I'll switch to her. Rita, can you unmute yourself? Are you able to do that? I am unmuted. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. I just might need you to advance the slides. I don't know if I can do that. Okay. And if this is Dave, I want to point out we just have a few minutes left. Okay. Um, so yes, I'm the lead for the Cisco milk batch and Isley's milk batch. There's a species status assessment going on right now. We're also working with Karen Newland who is a biologist out of the Montana field office who is assisting us with that. And some of you have been contacted with her and, and we've had some one expert meeting already for that and we'll be having another one. Um, oh, I can advance. Um, okay, you ladies trusses, uh, there is a species status assessment going on for that as well. And Lark Wiley is the uh, lead for that. She unfortunately has had strep. She's on the call, but um, has a very scratchy voice right now. So I'll give updates for her. That species status assessment um, should be completed in fiscal year uh, 21. Um, some good news is that we have had two in occurrences located in Summit County and Emory County in 2020. So there was some good news that came out of 2020. Um, those two counties did not have positive occurrences recorded in them previously. Um, some of the biggest news with this species is that we worked with some modelers at headquarters and developed a potential a habitat model for the species that is range wide. So it's not just for Utah, it's for the entire range of the species. And this little map picture uh, below is an example. Uh, this is zoomed into the Uinta Basin. So previously we had areas identified by county, um, which was not really helpful um, for section seven and identifying areas to survey for the species. So this modeling effort does narrow down that, uh, that potential range. Um, we do know that it's gonna estimate a lot of areas that aren't habitat, but with modeling, it's very difficult to get things that fine. Um, so we are looking for feedback on the model as well for anybody who was out there doing the surveys. Um, and this can be found um, on the ECOS uh, website for the species profile and page, and it can be downloaded as a shape file. Um, next. Okay, Barnaby Ridgecrest. Uh, this is a species that I'll be working on five year review for this year. And really, the update for this is that we are again working with the same modeling group out of our headquarters to update the uh, potential habitat area for this species. Um, this is a draft, I want to emphasize. Um, but if you look here in blue, this was our area that we looked for the species previously. Um, and this is what is an IPAC still um, for, for looking uh, for overlap for section seven consultations. And there's a little, there's a little spot to the west um, that was found in 2014, I believe. And that is part of what prompted us to redo this habitat model. So our current draft for the potential um, range for the species is this green area. It's much larger, a much different shape. Um, it, it needs some ground truthing. Um, again, that's where anybody who is out there can help provide us some feedback. We're looking for feedback from experts um, on this model um, as well, or at least, at least on the area included in the model. Um, and I think we're low on time. So is there another one? 
Okay, uh, conservation agreement implementation for Grams and White River Beer Tongue. Um, we were able to work with partners and extend the conservation agreement by five years. So it expires in 2034. Um, we updated some conservation area boundaries. We added some areas to the conservation agreement. We also made some edits and removed some small areas that were mostly um, either already developed and should not have been included or were artifacts of GIS um, that were just uh, little corrections. Our annual report is in process. Um, we hope to have that, I think, completed by the end of this month. Um, and that annual report does go on the CITLA website, which is cited at the, at the bottom of this slide. So all of our annual reports and the conservation agreement and the plans are all available on that public website. Um, we are continuing to focus primarily right now on implementing the range-wide monitoring plan for both of the species. Um, we had a few revisions with the monitoring plan um, uh, to kind of um, make it feasible and make sure we were gathering the data that we needed um, for these species. Um, okay, next. Um, we are still continuing to work uh, in the Uinta Basin on a well pad restoration research project with the USGS. Uh, the purpose is to explore the best practices for restoration of, uh, it shouldn't actually say legacy well pads, sorry, it should just say well pads in the Uinta Basin. And we're working with USGS, BLM, and private industry and other researchers out there to uh, you know, develop the the research questions and in the techniques that are being looked at. All right, back to Jenna for the pollinators. So, you know, this is a good handy reference slide for some of the pollinator work. You know, we did have a big decision for the monarch butterfly in December. Um, it remains a candidate and we're actively working on candidate uh, conservation agreements and really just expanding conservation efforts, particularly for the Western population, which has a pretty high extinction risk. Um, the Eastern population, so that's east of the, the Rocky Mountains, that is where we have over 90% of the total population for monarchs. Um, and so, you know, uh, Tracy or Lark um, in our office is the lead um, for monarchs and these other pollinators. So we are trying to work with Mindy and other partners. I think Mindy's really taken the lead on, on the pollinator work for the state, um, but we definitely want to support her efforts um, for that work. And then we just have a whole host of partners. We really appreciate them and we couldn't do conservation in the state without them. So thank you all very much. Um, that wraps up what we have. <laughs>